Welcome back. So this is the second video of part five, which is called The God of the Left Hemisphere. Let's get back into it. So to recap uh, what we talked about on the last video. So I reviewed uh, scientific research suggesting that the left cerebral hemisphere is specialized for the predictable, the known, the routine uh, order. And the right cerebral hemisphere is specialized for the unpredictable, the unknown, uh, the novel chaos. I reviewed evidence that the primary difference between the cerebral hemispheres is, is in how they pay attention to the world with a narrow, detail-oriented kind of attention on, in the left hemisphere and a more broad and open kind of attention in the right hemisphere. And I argued based on scientific research, some of which is my own, but most of which is from other people, uh, that the these same differences characterize the autism schizotypy continuum. So the autistic type, which you might call the autistic type, which I have characterized as the engineer, somebody who has a kind of engineering mindset, uh, is specialized for order. They have a highly precise perceptual system, uh, which is best suited for picking up on lawful patterns, right? So uh, it can be very complex, but with little noise in the pattern. The schizotype, what you might call the schizotype, somebody who is high and positive schizotypy. Uh, you can think about that as the poet. Uh, they are specialized for chaos and they have an, a more imprecise perceptual system, which is better at picking up on noisy patterns, right? Patterns with lots of noise uh, in them. So as an overview of what we're going to talk about in this video, so I'm going to review the anthropologist uh, Harvey Whitehouse's theory that there are two different modes of religiosity, right? There's two different types of religiosity uh, that we can see manifest across history. And he calls these the doctrinal mode on the one hand, which is the more recent mode that came about after the advent of agriculture and the imagistic mode, which is the older mode uh, that characterizes most hunter gatherers. And I'm going to review evidence that the doctrinal mode is associated with what you might think of as the left hemisphere or the relatively autistic mode of thought uh, order, while the imagistic mode is, associ is associated with a more right hemisphere uh, or schizotypal mode of thought chaos. And I'm going to review evidence that the leadership uh, in these religious modes tended to play very different roles, right? So uh, the shaman on the one hand, which is the, the leader that would tend to characterize the imagistic mode played a very different role uh, in the group than the priest who was the, the religious leader for the doctrinal mode. And I'm also going to make the case that these would be associated with uh, autistic traits. So autistic like traits that the priest would be somebody who would be relatively high in autistic like traits. It's not even my original case. Other people have, have suggested that. Uh, that the ascetic priests tend to be relatively relatively autistic. And then, of course, we've already talked about the fact that uh, shamanism has been associated with the psychosis continuum, which is positive schizotypy. So I'm also going to make the case that in these early agricultural societies, uh, and again, this isn't my case, other people have made this case, the doctrinal priests suppressed shamanistic religious practices. They suppressed them... Um, often violently. Uh, they were competition, basically. And the priestly mode of religion, right? It's been winning. Right? It's been winning this ancient religious battle. I would characterize it as an ancient religious battle between order and chaos, right? Between an, an orderly mode of religion and the very, the much more chaotic mode of sh shamanistic religion. Um, and that this has consequences that are still affecting our culture today. And we're going to talk about those probably not so much in this video, but in, in the next video. So modes of religiosity theory. This was a theory of religiosity that was put forward by the anthropologist Harvey Whitehouse. He originally put it forward in, in a 2002 book, uh, but he made the case more explicitly in this 2004 book called Modes of Religiosity. Uh, and he suggests that there are these two different modes of religious experience, but not only religious experience, also ritual uh, as well. Ritual plays a really important uh, part of his theory. And the imagistic uh, religion is older. So this is what would tend to characterize hunter-gatherer groups. And it typically involves these very intense, right, these experientially intense rituals, uh, which serve to strongly bond together small groups of people. The doctrinal religion, on the other hand, came about more recently after the advent of agriculture, probably not until we had literacy. Um, there's some debate about that, about whether or not doctrinal religions would have been able to come about before literacy or whether they needed literacy. I tend to think that they probably really needed literacy to get off the ground, but uh, I, I, you know, my thesis doesn't rely on that. So 
Uh, but doc doctrinal religions are more recent. They involve uniting people around a shared set of doctrinal beliefs. Uh, so a shared set of, of beliefs, of orthodoxies, ba basically. And they, they use less intense, uh, more routine or routinized rituals. And so, as I said, I'm going to argue that these can be related to hemispheric differences and to the autism schizotypy continuum. So these are the main differences between the doctrinal and imagistic religions, uh, according to Harvey Whitehouse. So doctrinal religions use uh, low intensity rituals, but, but they, they have these rituals very often. And so like the, the most extreme case of this is probably like praying towards Mecca five times a day that you see in Islam. Uh, it's a very doctrinal way of doing ritual. Uh, on the imagistic side, right, you have these highly intense rituals. You don't do them as often, or you don't you don't need to. You couldn't do them as often, right? So this will involve things like taking psychedelic drugs or fear induction. Uh, lots of times they induce fear in young initiates or pain, right? So pain. Uh, one of the um, uh, examples of this are the South American tribes, or maybe it's just one tribe, who makes their young men put on gloves filled with bullet ants. Bullet ants are the most painful sting of any insect in the world. And they have to wear these gloves for like five minutes with hundreds of bullet ants in them. And then uh, that's like their initiation to become a man. And they have to do this multiple times. I'll, probably, I'll put a link to that in the, in the description. But that would be an example of an imagistic ritual that you're not going to find. You know, you're never going to find the Catholic Church making people go through extremely painful rituals, right, to be a Catholic, right? There's just not, it wouldn't work. Um, so on the doctrinal side, what you have are... Uh, logically integrated theological orthodoxies, right? Usually they're written down. And, you know, if you're somebody who's, uh, let's say, a kind of a new atheist type person, you may say, oh, well, it's not logical at all. But there's been a huge amount of effort, you know, in Christianity, for example, uh, but not just Christianity, other religions too, right? There's been a huge amount of intellectual effort in making these theo theological orthodoxies logically integrated so that they all make sense, Um they, they all sort of make, they all sort of hang together, right? And that's very important in the doctrinal mode. In the imagistic mode, um, orthodoxy is not nearly as important. So uh, people will generally interpret the their experiences under these intense rituals in a more individualistic way. They may have help interpreting them from the shaman or whatever, but there's not an enforced orthodoxy. You're not going to see anybody getting burned at the stake for being a heretic in an imagistic religion because what you believe is not actually that important, right? What's really important is that you have these shared experiences together. And the doctrinal mode works mainly through procedural and semantic memory. So we have these different memory systems. Uh, procedural memory is is a more embodied memory. So it's kind of like riding a bike. Uh, riding a bike, you have to you have to have this embodied procedural memory of how to do it. Uh, semantic memory is like rote memorization, so memorizing vocabulary words. And then in the imagistic mode, it works mainly through episodic memory, right? Our, our memory of actual events that happen to us in the world, uh, because that's how those kinds of rituals uh, have an effect on people is by their episodic memory of them. Uh, the doctrinal mode tends to support large, hierarchically organized social structures. So these are the kind of social structures that came about after the advent of agriculture. We, we became much more hierarchically organized and uh, grouped together into much larger civilizations. And the imagistic mode tends to support small and relatively egalitarian social structures. They have to be small because in order for the imagistic rituals to work, you have to have the experience together as a group. And so you can't have 100,000 people doing an imagistic ritual together. It just doesn't work. Uh, so the doctrinal mode in that way, it weakly binds many people together. So it, it can bind many people together, but it does so in a relatively weak way compared to the imagistic mode, which strongly binds a, a small group of people together. Because of course, if you go through these extremely intense rituals together, uh, you'll be more closely bonded together. And we see this even today with like uh, the rituals that people have to go to go through to join a fraternity at a college, right? You have to go through these rituals with all of your, um, with all of the other pledges and that will hopefully bind you together into a group. Um, the religious leadership in the doctrinal mode consists of a priesthood and the priesthood is really there to promote and to protect the orthodoxy. Uh, which is very different from what the shaman does. Uh, so religious leadership in the imagistic mode consists typically of something like a shaman. And shamans, 
are not in a guild. Like priests are together in kind of a guild, right? They're all sort of a part of the same thing. Shamans are much more individualistic. Um, they they kind of have more of a market economy with shamans. Like you can choose, you know, if you have a relatively large sort of tribe, you can kind of choose which shaman you want to go to. Uh, and but they and they they work through altering states of consciousness um, through ritual uh, means. They also act as healers. Um, and of course, shamans also do some some kind of nefarious. They also do like some. Um, they, they they create illusions that things are working when maybe they're actually not. But uh, but anyways, the shamans did play a, an important cultural role. Anyways, so uh, and with the doctrinal mode again, there's some debate about this, but it's it's likely I think that some form of literacy needed to precede the advent of of doctrinal religion, at least a fully fledged doctrinal religion. And imagistic uh, mode was likely the original form of religious participation. So Harvey Whitehouse is definitely not the first scientist, the first person studying these things to identify these two modes of religiosity. Uh, uh, other people who study religion, quite a few other people have identified uh, dichotomous modes of religion, but they've called them different things. So Max, Max Weber uh, uh, distinguished routinized and charismatic forms of religion. Routinized would be doctrinal, charismatic would be imagistic. Uh, Leonard Slane, who we'll talk about here in a minute, distinguished uh, uh, between religion based on the word on the one hand and on the image on the other, doctrinal and imagistic. Anthropologist Ruth Benedict uh, contrasted what she called Apollonian religion with Dionysian. The Apollonian and the Dionysian are kind of like these, uh, the, the, those terms actually come from Nietzsche, uh, and they basically can be thought of as order and chaos, really. So, more recently, uh, the archaeologist William Dever uh, wrote this really interesting book called Did God Have a Wife? And we're going to talk about this more in part, uh, part six. But in that book, he distinguished between what he called state religion and folk religion. And of course, state religion is doctrinal religion and folk religion is imagistic religion. And he, he did this based largely on his archaeological work in Israel. He's an archaeologist. And so he argued that in Israel, there was a, a male literate elite who, and these were the, the writers and the editors, at least the editors of the Old Testament. Uh, and, and it was this male literate elite who were the proponents of the state religion. While mo most of the common people kind of straddled, you know, maybe they participated in the, sta in the state religion, but at least in their own time, they practiced more of a folk religion. Um, and this was especially true of women. Uh, so women who, who practiced this kind of folk religion within the home, uh, they, they practiced a different and more experiential kind of religion and an experience based religion, which is the imagistic mode. And so in his in his book, he lays out some of the characteristics that are associated with each of these religious types. So the state or the doctrinal religion, he says, uh, it's literate, it's based on texts, it's based on belief, it's verbal, uh, it's intellectual, it's based on dogma, it's rational, uh, it attempts to be rational anyways. It's, it's more about uniting the nation. So the doctrinal religion was there to unite the nation of Israel, right? What, what these male literate elites wanted to do, uh, and they had very good reasons for wanting to do this, was to unite the tribes of Israel uh, into a single entity, because, of course, they were surrounded by people who kind of wanted to conquer them, and that would make them a little more dangerous. Uh, so they were, they were nationalist in that way. Uh, it's about, a, it's, a, it's generally a state religion. It's about political order, right? Maintaining political order and orthodoxy. And then on the imagistic side or the, uh, the folk religion side, as he calls it, uh, it's more improvisational. Uh, it's more about the practice, right? Rather than belief, it's about what you do rather than what you believe more symbolic rather than verbal. So that's the image and word dichotomy, uh, more about action, more emotive, more mystical, more local rather than national. Um, uh, you might see local differences in how things are practiced. Uh, more based within the family uh, rather than the rather than the state, and yeah. So, and again, I think that's clearly he's clearly picking up on the same dichotomy that Harvey Whitehouse is picking up on. And so, uh, Harvey Whitehouse said about this after reviewing some of these different dichotomies. He said, and I quote: "At the root of all such dichotomous models is a recognition that some religious practices are very intense emotionally." They may be rarely performed and highly stimulating. That is, 
they may involve altered states of consciousness or terrible ordeals and tortures. They tend to trigger a lasting sense of revelation and to produce powerful bonds between small groups of ritual participants. By contrast, certain other forms of religious activity tend to be much less stimulating. They may be highly repetitive or routinized, conducted in a relatively calm and sober atmosphere. Such practices are often accompanied by the transmission of complex theology and doctrine, and also tend to mark out large religious communities composed of people who cannot possibly all know each other, or certainly not in any intimate way. End quote. So, as we see, doctrinal religion involves these routine, low-intensity rituals, and it's primarily about maintaining shared beliefs, right, in these logically coherent theological orthodoxies, right? It's, it's associated with large, hierarchically organized social groups. The imagistic religion, on the other hand, involves less frequent but higher intensity rituals, which are about uh, inducing shared experiences between people that tightly bond uh, together small groups of people. So Leonard Slane, uh, Leonard Slane was uh, a surgeon and kind of a polymath. He wrote a lot of books on his life and he wrote this book called The Alphabet Vers Versus the Goddess. And in that book, and we're going to talk about this uh, more in, in part six, but in that book, he documented how any anytime something, anytime a place becomes literate, uh, they suppress goddess worship. Right. And he documents this in a few different places. Um, Goddess worship, it's not really primarily that they're suppressing goddess worship. It's that they're suppressing the folk religion, or right? they end up suppressing the folk religion. And that, it, that just is associated with goddess worship, although there's also gods that they worship too. Um, or on average, you know, they tend to anyways. So he suggested in that book that there is a connection between the functioning of the cerebral, uh, the cerebral hemispheres and these two modes of religiosity. And uh, he claims that the doctrinal mode is associated with the left hemispheric style of cognition and the imagistic mode with the right hemisphere. Um, as with White House right, and others, Schlein notes that there has been a movement away from imagistic religion over the course of history. So we've moved away from imagistic religion towards doctrinal religions, um, which would indicate that we've moved from the right hemisphere kind of religion towards the left hemisphere kind of religion which uh, lines up, of course, with Ian McGilchrist's thesis. So he, he claimed, and this was uh, in concert with others who have also claimed, um, actually Harvey Whitehouse probably shouldn't be on here, but other, other people. So I think it was Pascal Boyer who claimed that it would uh, literacy would be necessary. Whitehouse, I think, is a little bit on the fence about it. Uh, and I'm a little bit on the fence about it, too. But anyway, so Schlein claimed that it was the advent of literacy that drove religions away from the folk or imagistic mode and towards the doctrinal mode. Uh, and he also claimed that the advent of literacy moved people towards a more left hemispheric mode of cognition so that learning to read actually kind of shifts your mode of cognition towards the left hemisphere. And that helps to drive these changes. At the time he was writing that, uh, so he was writing in the mid 90s, the book was published in 1998, uh, the evidence that literacy would change the balance between the hemispheres was pretty scarce at that time, I think. I think he was kind of going off of an intuition more than anything. Um, today, the evidence is actually much stronger. So uh, you can see some of this reviewed in Stanislaus Dehaan's book, Reading in the Brain, and then Joseph Henrik also reviews it in The Weirdest People in the World, because of course, weird people are literate. And, uh, uh, tend to be highly literate. So Henrik uh, in, that, in that book reviews evidence that learning to read reduces your default tendency towards holistic visual processing in favor of more analytical processing. You now rely more on breaking scenes and objects down into their component parts and less on broad configurations and gestalt patterns. Uh, the, the gestalt being seeing the whole. And so, of course, the analytic slash holistic dichotomy is one of the most well-established hemispheric differences. The left hemisphere is analytic. It builds things up from the parts. The right hemisphere is holistic. It sees things uh, as a globe, uh, as a global object first. And so in that way, becoming literate actually moves your visual processing, interestingly enough, towards the more left hemisphere mode. Stanislaus Dehaan, in his 2009 book, uh, Reading in the Brain, said, and I quote, that the literate brain engages many more left hemispheric resources than the illiterate brain, even when we only listen to speech. And so, uh, and that's the end of the quote. And 
so as, as Schlein claimed in his book, uh, learning to read actually does shift people's cognition more towards the left hemispheric mode. And so uh, a population that learns to read will become more sort of left hemispheric in their, uh, in their general take on the world, you might say. So I'm now going to move on to talk about this in terms of the autism schizotypic continuum. And I, I think there's good reason to believe that the propensity to enjoy each mode of religiosity, right? So like some people are going to like the doctrinal mode better, and some people are going to like the imagistic mode relatively better, um, relatively more, I should say. Uh, and I think there's good reason to believe that people who are high in autistic like traits would really not like the imagistic mode so much and would like the doctrinal mode more and also would be more likely to adopt a leadership position within the doctrinal mode. Uh, so the autistic type, the engineering type would be more suited for the doctrinal mode and the schizotypal type, as we've already talked about, would be more so suited for the imagistic mode. So we're going to go over uh, some of the evidence for that. So. We talked earlier about how the doctrinal mode tends to use procedural and uh, rote memorization. And people high in autistic like traits are known to have very strong rote memorization. Uh, and this would make them better than other people at memorizing the complex theological orthodoxies that go along with religious leadership in the doctrinal mode. So if you're going to be a religious leader in one of these, mo in the doctrinal mode, um, you're going to have to know the orthodoxy, right? You're going to have to um, be able to learn it um, pretty easily, or at least better than other people. And people high in autistic like traits would very likely be better at doing that sort of thing than other people. Autism is also associated with hyperlexia, uh, so which is early precocious reading ability. 80% um, of people with hyperlexia have a comorbid autism diagnosis. And so that would mean that people high in autistic like traits would would very likely have been among the first in their groups to become literate. Um, and that means they, they, they would have been among the first to be eligible for the priesthood. Um, you know, something I don't mention in this slide, which I should have mentioned, is that pre the priesthoods are always male. The priesthoods are always made up of men. So women participate in the imagistic mode all the time. Women do not, and women participate in the doctrinal mode, but rarely do you see women taking on leadership positions in the doctrinal mode. Uh, virtually always in the doctrinal mode, you see that women are excluded from leadership. And this is really interesting, right? Because um, autism is is uh, hugely skewed towards being a male disorder. Uh, and, and men are, are much higher in autistic-like traits in non-clinical populations. Men are much higher in, uh, in autistic-like traits than women. Um, doctr doctrinal rituals are routine and low arousal. And that means that they would be more suitable for people high in autistic-like traits because people high in autistic-like traits, it's well established that they have a preference for routine. They don't like uh, they don't like change in their environment that much uh, on average, and um, and they have an aversion on average to strong sensory stimuli. In, in autism, this is often uh, referred to as sensory overload. Right? People with autism get sensory overload, but even in people who don't have like full fledged autism spectrum conditions, um, they would still be likely to avoid this this strong sensory input uh, associated with imagistic rituals. So. The, uh, the priesthood in the doctrinal mode often takes on ascetic behaviors. So they, they engage in fasting and sexual abstinence and things like that. Uh, there's a recent paper, uh, Honest 2018, who argues that these behaviors, right, these ascetic behaviors would be associated with the autism spectrum. So I'm going to read something that Honest said about this, and I quote, the comparisons of ascetic activities to behaviors observed among the population segment on the autism spectrum suggest that the cultural institution of ascetic monasticism did not emerge without an impulse from nature. Gradually, the high monastic culture and the neurological condition of autism became completely intertwined. The debate about the powers of nature and nurture should learn from the example of ancient asceticism. The primary urge for the emergence of ascetic behaviors can be plausibly explained to come from higher than usual prevalence of autistic traits in the population, end quote. And so he's making a pretty strong claim there. He's claiming that uh, the emergence of monastic priesthoods was basically just because there were there were some groups that had a lot of autistic type people in them. Um, regardless of whether that particular claim is true, I think he makes a very good case in the paper that that kind of monastic priesthood would be very appealing to somebody who is high in autistic-like traits, 
uh, for a variety of reasons, but largely because of the ascetic lifestyle. So Harvey Whitehouse, uh, in his 2004 book, Modes of Religiosity, he argued that rituals in the imagistic mode, and I'm going to quote him here, he said that they tend to generate rich exegetical or theological knowledge based on loose and fluid thematic associations, where concrete properties of ritual choreography and paraphernalia are felt to stand for more abstract processes such as plant growth, spiritual trans transformation, mammalian gestation, and so on, end quote. Now, what he's saying there is that in the imagistic mode, the rituals, in order to benefit from the rituals, let's say, in order to get something out of the rituals, you, you need to make these loose, uh, fluid associations. And these are the kinds of associations that are found in poetry, like novel metaphors. Um, and these are the kinds of associations that people high in autistic like traits don't tend to do very well with. Uh, the orderly, you know, we talked in the last video about the orderly, rigid semantic networks that are associated with autism, which are useful for some things, um, but not for this, right? So they, they, they tend to preclude making these kinds of loose and fluid associations. Um, and then also, it's just the case that many people with high levels of autistic like traits would have an aversion to the to the strong sensory stimuli that, that is associated with imagistic rituals, right? Because, of course, they're very experientially intense. Uh, there is some empirical evidence, I would suggest, for a connection between autism and the doctrinal mode of religiosity. So uh, Diego Gambetta and Stefan Hertog. Uh, wrote this book in 2016 called The Engineers of Jihad, and they provided evidence that engineers and other technical professions are overrepresented among radical Islamists. And they're actually like quite highly overrepresented. Um, and of course, as we've talked about before, engineers and other technical professions are associated with high levels of autistic like traits. So people with high levels of autistic like traits tend to go into those professions. And I'm not saying that they all become radical Islamists. That's clearly not the case. It's a minority, but it's it's a minority that's way higher than the rest of the population. Uh, and, and Gambetta and Hertog, they suggested that this connection uh, can be explained. They go through some reasons. They, they, they rule out some other explanations, right? Like people are recruiting these guys. Um, they, they think it can be explained by a particular type of personality that's found among engineers. And in an end note to the book, they do suggest that that personality is uh, autistic-like traits, basically. Uh, and they, they especially focused on the need for order. Well, that makes perfect sense, right? Because that is what doctrinal religions provide in some sense. They provide a, a real strict orderly regime of behavior and values and all this stuff, uh, which would be more appealing, you might think, to somebody who has a strong need for order. Uh, I would argue that radical Islam represents the most doctrinal version of an already very doctrinal religion. So, of course, Islam is associated with theological orthodoxies, with ritual, with routinized rituals like praying towards Mecca five times a day. So it's clearly a doctrinal religion, and the more radical versions are a more doctrinal version of that. Uh, so the fact that engineers and technical specialists are drawn to it provides at least some empirical uh, support for a link between autistic-like traits and doctrinal religions. So moving on to the imagistic mode and positive schizotypy. So positive schizotypy in the, in the scientific literature has been associated with having stronger and more vivid episodic memories. Right? So uh, people high in positive schizotypy report their own episodic memories as being more vivid than other people. And they're also more likely to experience involuntary episodic recall, uh, which probably makes them... There, so there is a connection between psychosis spectrum conditions and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's probably associated with that, right? this involuntary episodic recall. Um, and of course, White House, as we've talked about, White House claimed that the effectiveness of imagistic rituals were dependent on episodic memory. Um, uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, imagistic rituals also require the interpretation through making these loose and fluid associations. And as we've discussed, people high in positive schizotypy, they have this sort of poetic mind where they make these kinds of loose, fluid associations. Uh, they have a chaotic semantic network that affords that. And in part two, we discussed uh, the relationship between shamanism and schizotypy and psychosis. Uh, so shamans would have often been the religious leaders in the imagistic mode of religion. And shamanism has a long history of being associated with the psychosis continuum. Um, many shamans, many people who would go on to become shamans have an initiatory crisis, which if you read about these things, if you read the descriptions of them, it's, it's indistinguishable in many cases from, uh, an acute psychotic episode. 
And more recently, uh, and we talked about this in part two, so I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, but Ross and McKay uh, in this 2018 commentary did suggest uh, that non-clinical individuals who have low-level uh, positive symptoms of psychosis, which is just positive schizotypy, uh, would have been more likely to, to take on the role of shaman in these groups. Uh, and so this means that, that people high in positive schizotypy would have very likely been better off in groups that used a more imagistic mode of religiosity since being a shaman is typically associated with a relatively high status. And, um, and so it would have been beneficial to have that kind of temperament in those groups. Shamans uh, played an important role in facilitating these intense high arousal rituals that bonded people together in the imagistic mode. So Hayden, in his 1987 paper, said this about it, and I quote, Once near ecstasy, hunter-gatherer rituals come alive with all the dramatic effects that could be summoned to make the experience unforgettable. Masked monsters or spirits, flames and darkness, bull roars, drumming, and an entire panoply of sensory effects ensured total involvement in the forging of the strongest emotional bonds that the human race has ever known. The shaman was above all someone who could induce ecstatic states in himself and others. The shaman performed a kind of social magic and created strong social bonds. These bonds were critical to survival. And so the shaman was somebody who uh, who facilitated these imagistic rituals, right? These highly intense imagistic rituals that bonded small groups of people together. So I think it's also the case that that people high in positive schizotypy would not like the doctrinal mode very much. So one of the downsides of the doctrinal mode that Whitehouse talks about is what he calls the tedium effect, which is basically just it's really boring for a lot of people, right? Like going to church is boring. Doing the rituals are boring. OK, and some people get more easily bored than others. And those people are high in positive schizotypy. Um, positive schizotypy is associated with novelty seeking, uh, sensation seeking. And that means people high in positive schizotypy get bored relatively easily. Uh, so they would be more likely than the autistic type of person, right, the engineering type of person to find these routine rituals uh, unbearably boring. Right? And that would make them not so suited for that mode of religiosity. And of course, in autism, we find that they they often spontaneously engage in routine rituals, right? Like that's repetitive behavior. Uh, and so they would have been much more likely to to find those kinds of routinized rituals appealing. So as we already talked about, religious leadership in the doctrinal mode will often require literacy. And as we talked about in the last video, there is an empirically established association between dyslexia and positive schizotypy. It's not a strong association, but it's there. And that just means it's very likely that people high in positive schizotypy would have lagged behind other people uh, holding th holding like IQ constant. They would have lagged behind other people in picking up literacy uh, when it first came around. And so they would have been uh, less likely to be able to take on religious leadership positions in the doctrinal mode, since uh, many people have argued that that literacy would be would be required for taking on a, lit a leadership position in that kind of uh, religious environment. So, Pascal Boyer, in this 2002 commentary on Harvey Whitehouse's theory, points out. Uh, so, Pascal Boyer is a religious scholar. He's written a lot about. Uh, the psychology of religion. And he points out that doctrinal religious authorities have actively and often very brutally suppressed shamanic practices throughout history. Uh, we can see this in the Old Testament a little bit, where the the very doctrinal editors of the Old Testament and, and writers to some degree uh, are very highly opposed to the pagan or you might say more shamanic religious activity going on around them. There's lots of talk of, of all of the, the evil pagans uh, surrounding them. And uh, the kind of religious services that people high in positive schizotypy uh, would be more likely to offer are actively suppressed under a doctrinal religion, right? Generally speaking, doctrinal religions don't look kindly on people uh, going out in the woods and dancing and taking psychedelics and things like that, right? That's uh, uh, generally not something you go to church and do, uh, although maybe you should. So Boyer's analysis of this sort of thing is really worth quoting at length here. And so I am going to quote him at length. Boyer says, and I quote, among the many consequences of the emergence of complex agrarian polities is the appearance of castes or guilds of specialists in all sorts of technical skills. 
in craftsmanship, of course, but also in bookkeeping, in writing, in ritual, in any such polity. There will be a competition between various providers of religious services, people who earn their keep, their status, or their influence in exchange for perceived religious competence. Some of these providers are similar to the shamans and other local specialists found in most human groups. Their claim to efficacy is based on local reputation, on apprenticeship with a famed specialist, on supposed connections to local supernatural agents, in general on their own individual characteristics. But other religious specialists going the equivalent of craftsmen's guilds. He goes on, The priest's claim to a share of the religious market is based on features that contrast with those of shamans. A religious guild promises to deliver a stable, uniform kind of service that only it can provide, but also a service that any member of the guild will provide in the same way. Proper service depends not on the personal qualities of the specialists, but on their being similar to any other member of the guild. Naturally, a group like that will claim connection, not to local spirits and ancestors, but to larger scale supernatural agents with whom the guild proposes to interact with in the same way, regardless of the particular place and customers. Given that such guilds only appear in complex polities, and that these very often had some writing system, it is not surprising that the guilds also used writing. A great advantage of writing is that it facilitates the uniformity of service and practice that is the main selling point of such professional groups. So religious guilds that set great store by literate sources, written transmission, and the kind of systematic argument made easier by writing are more likely to subsist than groups that ignored the technology of writing. Conversely, given that uniformity and substitutability are important assets of the guild, features uh, of shamanic revelation are actively discouraged. All these features of religious guilds contribute to create what White House rightly describes as a very special mode of transmission, one in which there is a sharp distinction between the specialists and the congregation's respective roles, where the specialists are all trained in the same way and convey similar messages, where these messages are made uniform by constant repetition and explicit argumentation, and where the mode of transmission almost invariably involves the reading and commenting of written texts. Doctrines are promoted by professional guilds, and guilds depend on the stable and decontextualized provision of similar services. Guilds are cartels. Groups of craftsmen the world over try to make prices and services uniform and repress attempts to individualize the offer. In the same way, we know that members of religious guilds intuitively perceive that charismatic specialists dangerously threaten their group's overall grip on the market. The conflict is a political one. So, end quote. So, the advent of agriculture, right, and especially literacy, facilitated, facilitated the creation of these religious guilds or religious cartels of specialists, which we call priests. These priests, unlike the shaman, right, they enforced uniformity of service, uh, inform uniformity of belief and ritual, orthodoxy. Right, they, they enforced the orthodoxy because that was their that was their selling point. Right, they, they, we all uh, provide the same service. The shaman, right, who was ecstatic, individualistic, charismatic, often halfway insane, right, and it's very hard to control halfway insane people, um, posed a threat to the priestly guild. And the shaman has been suppressed, right? Uh, and often violently suppressed anywhere the priesthood has arisen. That shamanic mode, right? The experiential mode of religiosity has been suppressed uh, brutally and violently. And this is, I would suggest that this is equivalent to this, to an ancient religious battle between essentially order and chaos, right? Order in the sense of uniformity, uh, routinized rituals, uh, uh, orthodoxy, right? Dogma on the one hand, and uh, ecstatic, charismatic, experiential religiosity on the other. So to, uh, to sort of compare, right, the figure of the priest and the, and the figure of the shaman, right, the priest really functions to maintain political and religious order and stability, right? So we, we talked about this with, with William Devers uh, stuff. Uh, the priests facilitate a kind of state religion. Right? They're there to promote the, the stability and the order of the state, uh, primarily. The shaman does something very different. Right? The shaman is there to induce personal and social transformations. Um, 
uh, through these highly intense rituals, right? Not to maintain stability, right? But to facilitate transformation. And the priest facilita facilitates these low intensity, routinized rituals, and these serve to promote memorization of theological orthodoxies. The shaman facilitates high intensity rituals, uh, which promote personal transformations and promote group bonding, which is a kind of group transformation in some sense. Um, the priest, I have argued, other people uh, have made very similar arguments, is associated with autistic-like traits, right? The engineering mindset, a preference for order, a preference for routine, a preference for structure. The shaman, which many other people have argued, is associated with positive schizotypy or the predisposition to psychosis, right? This is the poetic mind, uh, the preference for novelty, preference for intense experiences, and so on. Uh, the priest would tend to support large, hierarchically organized social structures, while the shaman would tend to be the specialist among uh, smaller groups of relatively egalitarian social structures. The priest, uh, the priesthood was associated with a uniformity of belief, a uniformity of ritual and religious service, uh, which would be strictly enforced. Uh, the shamans were more individualistic. They were specialists. Uh, they, they had no need to enforce conformity, right? The market would decide their value, right? So they offered their services, and if people didn't like it, then they just didn't, you know, there was no nobody there to enforce it. Uh, I would suggest, my suggestion is that we can usefully think of the priest as an agent of order, right? They're there to preserve stability, to preserve the current order. And the shaman is very different, right? The shaman is an agent of chaos, right? They're an agent of social transformation. And that is, that is also the claim that Jordan Peterson made in Maps of Meaning, which we talked about in part two. So in this video, we have looked at evidence that there are two distinct modes of religiosity. Uh, these modes have been called a variety of names in the literature. So, for example, doctrinal versus imagistic, Apollonian versus Dionysian, word versus image, state versus folk. Uh, I think it's clear to me, it's clear to other people that these, even though people have called these different names, they're picking up on the same underlying pattern. Uh, Leonard Schlein associated these modes with the left hemisphere, the doctrinal mode, and the right hemisphere, the imagistic mode, while others including me, uh, have associated leadership in these modes with autistic traits, autistic-like traits for priests and positive schizotypy traits for shamans. The advent of agriculture, and especially of literacy, led to the rise of priesthoods, uh, these guilds of religious specialists who have suppressed, sometimes violently, uh, shamanistic practices for a very long time, uh, many thousands of years at this point largely because shamanistic practices pose a threat to the monopoly that the priesthood holds on religious services. Um, they need to protect their, their share of the market. And the shaman, um, the shaman is, a, is a threat to that. So that is it uh, for video two of part five. Uh, we'll continue on in the third video uh, next time looking at the way that morality is done in the priestly mode of religiosity and how that might be different from the way it was done before the rise of, of priesthoods. Uh, there was a change in how we thought about morality uh, after the advent of agriculture, probably especially after the advent of literacy. So I'll see you there. Goodbye.